to my talk on hacking the uh, DEF CON 27 badge. My name is Seth Kintai. My background is hardware and computer security, so this project was a lot of fun for me. I just want to give a little background on some of the terminology we'll be using in this presentation. Uh, NFMI, Near Field Magnetic Inductions, it's basically using magnetic waves and fields to communicate instead of radio. And magnetic fields decay at a much faster rate than uh, radio does. Passes through um, body tissues better, so it's better for uh, short distances, for uh, body area networks. The short distance supposedly makes it more secure. Um, it's more efficient um, and hasn't been used too much. It basically uses two coils to communicate with each other, sort of like um, electromagnets or half of a transformer talking to each other instead of using antennas. And it's used in proximity cars as part of the NFC protocol. And it's used in some hearing aids and I think some earbuds, but not too many other locations. Um, and maybe they had dreams of putting it in Apple earbuds because the, I read that somewhere in a blog, but the company was extremely cagey about any sort of information on these chips. There was no data sheet at all, which is bizarre. Uh, no info on the protocol, no dev kits, no samples. If you wanted to order anything, you had to order like tens or hundreds of thousands and sign an NDA. Just couldn't find any real uh, official info on these chips. Um, software defined radio, basically taking all the hardware guts and making them virtual and putting them into software. Makes designing new radios and mixing and matching parts much easier and more fun. Um, I use GNU radio to do that sort of thing and modulate demodulate signals. Do some other tools with that too. I used HackRF to um, receive and transmit my signals and tune them. Uh, there's no antennas, but I made a bunch of coils just wrapping like uh, electromagnetic wire, electromagnet wire. And I should probably have some pictures of those online at some point. And use Python for everything else. A few other terms you should know, buffer overflow attack is how that works. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Basically, just blow away everything on the stack and keep on writing until you overwrite the return address and take control of a program. Uh, SWD or JTAG, those are different um, uh, low level hardware debug interfaces. They're like GDB, but super low level. You can control the clock one cycle at a time. Fun stuff. And then a convolution code, basically, error correction code, spreads out um, bits over multiple symbols to make them more resistant to. Uh, noise. So the badge was part of a game. Um, they communicated, the badges communicate with each other and they like uh, make little beeping noises and uh, blink lights when they pair with each other. And then if you paired with a uh, magic badge, it would advance um, the stage of the game you were in. And there were six stages and you advance once for each of these different uh, magic versions of these flavors of badge. And then once you got all of them, you won by getting a piezoelectric rickroll. And the badges are actually cut from pieces of stone, and there's a great presentation on that you should check out. Um, the badge hardware has a, an MCU that does most of the, the work, uh, controls the lights and speakers and whatnot, and talks to the NFMI chip over uh, UART. Um, when the MCU boots up, it loads firmware, and in that firmware there's a little patch of uh, firmware for the NFMI chip, and it sends that over UART and patches that on uh, boot up. Um, the debug, hardware debug interfaces are labeled on this picture. You can connect by serial and uh, talk to a console that's running on the MCU or you can connect to uh, SWD and do some really low level debugging. There's no connectors on there. There's a, in that picture, there's a connector soldered onto the uh, serial port, but they're just, they're unpopulated uh, connectors for now. And you can either solder on a connector or solder wires on directly or use a pressure fitting. Um, yeah. The badges, communicate in a sort of bizarre way. 
they went when the badge m c u wants to transmit eight bytes first it adds a d to the beginning then pads every single four bits every nibble with a d and then ends it with an ascii sends out over uart the nfmi chip receives that immediately strips all of that padding off and transmits it and the receiving badge receives that puts all that padding back on again sends it over uart and then the badge strips it all off again uh early on in the game i decided to reverse engineer the code that someone uh someone had pulled the firmware off the badge so i reverse engineered it and looking through and after a few hours of that um someone i think it was joe grant actually released the source code so it was sort of wasted time but on the other hand i'd never actually seen all the correct answers when reverse engineering code before but it was a new experience i tried plugging into ghidra it didn't work very well back then i don't know if it still does i ended up using an old version of uh ida pro and it worked a lot better while poking through with ida i found a buffer overflow and it seemed so obvious i sure was sure it had to be part of the game as you can possibly tell from the code it's basically reading bytes into a buffer until it finds a letter e and it will read that buffer is uh 18 bytes total but there's no limit it'll just read and read and read and read and read until it finds that e i made a proof of concept early on i wanted to make sure this uh buffer overflow was actually exploitable so in notepad i wrote up some arm code and just used an online uh, assembler to convert that into machine code and i wrote this little script here to um, use a jlink over swd not jtag i connected to the badge loaded my payload into the ring buffer i set the uh the the transmit index and the receive index values and this told the badge to run it thought it had a giant packet and we'll see what happens this is the serial console for the badge i'm telling it to receive a packet now i'm going to send it one the regular valid packet and that's what it displays now i run my uh, hack through jlink so now there's a uh, oversized packet sitting in the ring buffer next time i tell the badge to receive it my code takes over prints hack the planet on the screen well that worked so now i just need to figure out how to send a gigantic uh, custom crafted packet so i dug around online for specs on this uh, chip used on this badge the nfmi chip um, found a few details some good guesses on frequencies and bandwidths um, a pretty good guess on the modulation from a lot of random sources started looking at the signal um, in analog first you can on the top row you see uh, 16 bursts over about 10 seconds um, middle row i've magnified one of those bursts so you can kind of see where the different sections are in the bottom row lets you see the uh, four distinct sections of a, each burst. Section one seems to be timing pulses, sends um, a carrier frequency and then one that's 150 megahertz higher and then one 150 megahertz lower. It doesn't seem to be transmitting any data, but it may be doing this just to establish a range of frequency and amplitude of the signal as well as timing. Quick note on down conversion, if you're not familiar with the subject, it's just, you're not demodulating the signal, you're not changing it all, other than lowering the frequency by multiplying it with another signal. You kind of think of it like a, a beat frequency in music. So you're just shifting the signal down from, say, 10.569 megahertz, you're shifting that down to zero megahertz. So um, now all the energy is, is around that, plus or minus 200,000 K. Uh, kilohertz and it you can see how uh, the signals that were at the carrier frequency are now basically flat lines because they're at zero or almost zero and what a whole bunch of squiggles that weren't didn't look much different from each other are now much more clearly um, data you can see that there's repeating patterns in them so section two has these patterns um that it plays them twice 
sometimes exact copies sometimes they're inverted sometimes they swap places between i and q and there's only i think eight different patterns it shows i ended up calling these preambles based on them showing up later in the other packet section three just seems to be more timing tried my best to get it to be exactly zero hertz it never quite could and then the frequency would drift i think with temperature i don't really know and then section four was data it's 271 copies of the same data packet each one starts with eight variations of those preamble you saw in section two are almost exactly that preamble it's slightly different and then followed by data and then a brief uh null or pause and sometimes they are exact copies of each other and sometimes they're inverted sometimes the i and q swap just like with the preambles in section two the modulation used is d8 psk psk is phase shift keying it's basically modulating a signal so when you plot it it shows up as the bursts show up as one of those eight dots on that constellation you'll actually form that on a plot as long as your timing is right the eight refers to there being eight points in that constellation and then d means differential so it's the difference between each point is where your actual data is transmitted and each of those points is called a symbol the center frequency seems to move a little bit um in the beginning i had one frequency that i just narrowed down to a very precise frequency it was working very well very well until i broke the badge and then it switched to 1.4 and then later on i fixed another badge i had broken earlier and it was using 1.569 megahertz so the i don't quite understand why the frequency bounces around so much i was initially using a sample rate of two million samples per second but the timing didn't work out and i said oh well obviously it's if it's 596 kilohertz bandwidth then i need to use a a multiple of that for the sample rate so i used 1.192 but that didn't work out either and i ended up using this 1.19055 and that worked out perfectly for 440 samples per packet or four samples per symbol why that number i don't know I'm using HackRF to receive the signal. It does the down conversion and uh, resampling, so I can use it a, an easier to use frequency and it uses a much lower sampling rate because your sampling rate must be at least twice your highest frequency in your signal. And then I use GNU Radio to write my demodulator. Now there were some examples online of some lower order, like some four PSK demodulators and modulators, and I figured it would be easy enough to uh, modify one of those into 8 PSK but it ended up being a nightmare and they the examples used components that don't exist or never worked or were broken for other reasons and not documented and no one could help and the docs were a mess and it was kind of a nightmare so I uh, made a bunch of working examples of different flavors of my PSK modulators and demodulators and I put them all on uh, github to help other people out now I had to deal with noise and nulls. There's 271 copies of the, uh, the same packet, but they varied a bunch. But only some of that was the noise. It turns out that because of those null symbols at the beginning, a normal uh, D8PSK demodulator doesn't understand what those are and tries to put them into one of those eight quadrants. So it kind of interprets them as eight or three random symbols and then after those nulls there seemed to be an actual random symbol which is why there was eight different variations of both the preamble and of the packet now the nulls were new to me altogether, and you could maybe even call it like a sort of a ninth symbol in that constellation i googled around trying to find out other examples of it and nxp the maker of this nfmi chip they also make this cool flex bsp audio chip and it also uses a similar um, modulation scheme with nulls and those nulls are used for finding the timing of a signal so my uh, demodulator spits out a stream of symbols which i then i've manually parsed here just to make them more readable so you can see section one is 21 copies of um, just blasts of 
that signals basically junk in those symbols. Section 2, we see that preamble copied twice, followed by a little bit of noise and I think mostly nulls. Section 3 is just some more timing blasts. And then Section 4 is where our actual data lives. And these are the symbols for our packets, 271 copies of them. They should be identical. They're not because of some noise. So I had to write a Python program to basically ignore the first few bytes or a few symbols, then count up all the different patterns of packets that each flavor of packet are in there, and then whichever one has the most copies is judged to be the correct copy, and that's the one copy of that one is output. The preambles consist of 20 fixed symbols and then 12 that can be in one of three patterns. The Section 2 seems to flip randomly between two different sequences of those 12 preamble symbols. I don't know what they meant. I assumed that the one with mostly zeros could be like the mask for all zeros, but it doesn't quite seem to be right. It could be. I don't know. Never really figured that out. And then Section 4, every single packet always starts with the same preamble, which is different than the other two. And here we see the structure of the entire packet. We've got the header that has those nulls and that little random byte or random symbol referring to as the primer, and then the preamble. Then we have the packet data, which is 64 symbols corresponding to 16 bytes. The first four bytes appear to be a counter. Then there's one byte that is used as the length field for the user data, and then there's 11 bytes available for user data, but the badge only uses the first eight. The last three are just left unused. And then the footer has what are all 10 symbols that change with every single packet as the counter increments. So I assumed it was a checksum or C or C of some sort. Now I need to find the mask, the zero mask for all of the data, because if you fill a packet with zeros in the data fields, you don't get a packet full of zero symbols. You get a random looking pattern of symbols. This is the mask that they've used to either obfuscate what's being transmitted, or maybe it's used for spread spectrum or noise resistance or something. I'm not entirely sure, but basically when you send an empty packet, you don't send all zeros. You send a pattern. So I was able to easily change the first eight bytes to zeros and confirm that there's this crazy mask. Later on, I modified the firmware to allow me to, the MCU badge firmware, to allow me to send 11 bytes in a packet. Set all those to zeros, and that's what the pattern you see on the bottom of the screen. So I didn't actually see any sort of pattern in this pattern. Finding the mask for the other data bytes was a little more difficult. I was basically able to confirm that the counter was counting. It was counting by binary values, except it was counting by twos. And I didn't know if it was starting off odd or even. I basically had to guess. And because of the tail that it has in changed symbols, that was covering up some of the other symbols. So I needed a way to figure out something. I observed the counter incrementing in that binary fashion. I decided, well, I'll just record it for a week. Eventually, I found that after about a week, it finally flipped the tenth symbol. So I was able to get ten of the mask symbols. And then the tail of change afterwards, I have no idea what those bits are, so I don't know if they're ones or zeros. So only the green is what I'm positive, or so I thought, were zeros, based on my guess of what was odd or even at the beginning. And I realized that it took 19.1 hours to get the ninth, almost a week to get the tenth symbol. It was going to take decades to get 16 symbols, and over 9,000 years to get all 20. 
and i tried to brute force them but i just didn't know enough about the math of what was going on with these symbols in the values so i couldn't brute force them and i needed a smarter way then i got lucky by becoming unlucky i uh murdered a badge it got really angry it started transmitting a weird pattern instead of 110 symbol packets it was doing 108 symbols and 108 nulls um transmitted a different frequency and even weirder the counter slid over by four bytes so now instead of counting at byte zero through three it was counting at four through seven and i assumed initially that it set those first four bytes to all zero but this by watching it count the uh the upper bytes that let me figure out um well let me confirm um the mask for the length byte and helped me uh, to do some other bytes as well so i finally got the mask of the first five uh, bytes though at least assuming my uh, zero slash one guess was correct if it was odd or even that it started with so sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart um so i, I finished this up um, we'll kind of fast forward to the future a little bit, but I later on discovered that whenever you update the transmission badge or the, the packet that the badge transmits to other badges, um, it makes the counter count whatever it's counting count super fast, um, almost 350,000. So I wrote a script to count over and over and over, and that um, advanced all the bytes of the counter, which let me. Uh, confirm more mask bits. It also let me confirm that my initial guess was zero. Well, that and the uh, some erratic counting later on in the future when I was decoding um, the sequential count, which should be sequential, wasn't always sequential. It was bouncing around by eight or 32 and here and there. And I realized because my initial guess was wrong. So that get that. What I found above as a mask was actually the mask for the value of one. Um, it was really a mask of zero. But that also means that when I broke that badge, instead of all the bytes being zero, it was also started at one, which is weird. I don't know what that means. Next, I need to find the checksum mask, but really there's no way I could figure that out right now. All I can do is at least until I figure out the algorithm and then figure out the data and then figure out which part of the packet that the algorithm actually protects, like does it protect the preamble or not, you know. So basically I just guessed by picking um, symbols that I already seen in the packet, called that zero or just whatever, and moved on. So one thing that the counter indicated was uh, convolution code is being used. So for every um, odd bit that's changed, whereas we're defining an odd bit as there's bit one with LSB being bit zero, so bit one, bit three, bit five, if any of those change, only a single um, symbol is changed. But if an even bit is changed, then six of the next seven bits are changed, or uh, symbols are changed. Now that pattern looked suspiciously like the one used by the Voyager space probe. I don't know if that's coincidence or if that's somehow they've been adapted to use this into the, the badge transmission. I haven't figured that part out yet. It's also odd that only half of the bits are being protected because normally you'd want to protect all the bits from noise. Only having half doesn't do you much good. So to reverse engineer this, I started by changing just one bit at a time. Whenever you change one odd bit, um, that would just change one symbol and it always adds four to the symbol. If you change one even bit, then six of the next seven symbols change and in a pattern that depended on how far away that symbol was from the bit that was changed and based on the, the zero mask that was used at that location. So I figured out the pattern through just a lot of um, making examples and taking lots of notes and making crazy Excel sheets. 
and finally figured out the math of how a mask changes each bit at each position i've listed it by the symbol positions and then also listed it twice in two ways one is the code basically python code of where the mask is like what values the mask is and then um if that mask exists at that position like say mask is in one two one two five or six so if it is and that's a one times four plus two and as a more lower level electrical engineer sort of way to think about it i also included as a an array of bits so you can look at the bit math and possibly that could be related to the voyager probe but we'll worry about that later um so that figured out for a single bit but once you start using two bits or changing two bits at a time then the math gets really ugly again and it just goes crazy i tried coming up with really complicated algorithms to figure it all out but i eventually realized well why instead of doing that let me just treat everything as um just a mask every sum of every step is the mask of the next step and made seven different steps like that and it all worked out so here it is stepping through that um or you start off with the mask and then if the um you follow those rules from earlier to change if a bit changes then you add say six compute the sum that sum becomes the mask for the the next row the next the next the next so that rule of course doesn't make any difference if you're only changing one bit but when you're changing two bits say if the mask is three position zero you add three plus two you get the sum of five now you use five as the mask for the next bit down on and on and it actually worked except when i started decoding the uh, counter it didn't always count sequentially it did most of the time but every now and then it would freak out and then go back to working again and i realized that sometimes odd bits are convolved that in when it's multiple odd bits that have been flipped um but there wasn't much rhyme or reason to it i just started looking for patterns and anytime i found a pattern that worked for a lot of the problems i would code that uh, pattern up that would solve most of them but then a few more would slip through just did that a few times and i ended up with these four rules all the rules are interesting that they don't care what the current bit is they only look at previous bits some of them two of the rules care if previous bits were zero instead of one all those x's are the don't cares and you can see the rules are mostly don't cares but now we know the answer that all the bits have some sort of convolution code protecting them the first um convolution code that we saw earlier could be that voyager code could be a trellis code modulation i don't know if that's actually possible but i won't go into that and then the other convolution code is i have no idea i made that little circuit diagram for how i think it works but other than that i didn't recognize it anything i looked up online so now i need to reverse engineer the crc um and early on i noticed that each packet um or the crc has a possibility to contain basically 20 bits of data in those 10 symbols but when i um, counted up the number of patterns that actually showed up it was only 2 to the 12 or 40 96 patterns so that was telling me it was storing 12 bits in 20 bits which was strange and then there was also the issue that when you change a uh, a bit you can have a tail of up to six changes behind it and won't that tail of changes overwrite the nulls and primers and completely destroy the packets so something something odd was going on here i also confirmed that all of those symbols had to be used because if you tried changing any of them then the packet was rejected so clearly all those symbols were being checked so they all were important in one way or the other and um so I, I need to reverse engineer the crc if i ever wanted to make send my own custom packets i tried this tool called crc revenge and it just didn't seem to work at all on the values i was pulling out 
So I said, fine, screw it. I'll just write a Python program and brute force every possible CRC algorithm. And that didn't work either. So something really odd was going on. While looking through the CRC values of a bunch of packets in sequential order, I noticed that the checksum was changing by a predictable amount. Like every time just the lowest bit changed, it was XORing the checksum value by the same amount, which told me that the checksum was being built up by XOR probably from a table just like a CRC. And I poked through that some more, eventually found a pattern to it. But in the beginning, what I did was I used all the counter values to find where just a single bit change between two packets, XORed those packets or XORed the CRCs from those. And that gave me the XOR value for that single bit change. Did that for all the counter bits. Did that for a few of the length byte. Couldn't really do it for all the counter because even the high counter values would take months to flip through. But since I had realized that when you update a packet, it fast forwards it by some 350,000 clicks. So I wrote a program to speed it through a whole lot of those bits. And then I wrote another program to do a bit walk, basically change one bit in every data byte and walk that back and forth through all the data bytes. And then I wrote a cute little program to ingest all of those and build up the CRC table. Now that I had most of the CRC table values for each bit, I was looking through the changes in them and noticed a couple patterns. And the first was a pattern in how the actual data bits are stored in those symbols. And it's kind of ingenious the way they're spread out. So the first four symbols holds, or first two symbols holds four bits. And the next symbol after that holds two bits. So basically the way that it spread them out where the even bits are used and only the first three symbols, those even bits, since they have a tail that can be six long, that tail doesn't extend past the end of the CRC. So it doesn't overwrite the nulls or anything like that. So basically it used mostly the odd bits to store bits from the CRC and just a few of those even bits. And it made it all fit. And then for just extra fun, I guess, they shuffled the order of those bits all around. And that shuffling is what made the CRC revenge fail, what made my brute force tools fail. Once I removed the dead bits and rearranged the bits that actually had useful info in them, then suddenly CRC revenge worked perfectly. So now I can compute the CRC table for all 16 bytes. I also noticed a pattern between the values for every single bit in my table and used that pattern to fill up the rest of the symbols. But with CRC revenge, that also showed me the exact name and algorithm used for the CRC. So that was nice. So now my original guess for the mask, I knew it was wrong in the beginning for the CRC zero mask. But it worked anyway because basically since the CRC is built up by XORs and it was basically XORing my bad mask, which had my bad base value, and all those XORs were canceling out. And it worked most of the time, but it was flaky, probably because of those three bits that had tails that weren't quite XORs the way the tails change. So once I figured out the new mask, everything worked like rock solid. It was beautiful. I think the CRC doesn't protect the preamble. I think it's only covering the data. I tried coming up with counterexamples. I tried making a ton of different packets with using different preambles and testing all possible CRC values, and 
could make any other preambles work, so that's just an unknown. Also, I basically went with the assumption that the C or C of those 16 bytes, if they were all zero, that the end result would be zero, because that's how C or Cs work, and based my mask off that, and it worked. So with that, I can finally craft my own packets. Tools will be released on GitHub if they haven't been already. I can now basically make any 16-byte packet I want, except I need a 36-byte packet in order to overflow the badge, and possibly even more to do any cool attack. I knew this from the start, I just assumed that would fall into place along the way, but it didn't happen. Never found a field in the packet that actually let me set a longer packet length. Screwing around with the preamble didn't work, so it was time to try reverse engineering the NFMI firmware. To extract the NFMI firmware, I needed to run SWD, and to do that, I needed to be able to access the reset line, which unfortunately was buried in the middle layer of the board. The ball on the ball grid array on the bottom of the chip also was not accessible, so I had to pick through slides and other info from the presentation, figure out which ball on the grid it was, and then I zoomed in really close on some of the slides that didn't have the, so that middle image, it's from the slide, that's the circuit board before it has the white paint on it, so you can kind of see the middle traces faintly in the middle of the board. Also with one of my badges, I scraped all the white paint off, and I cut through the bottom layer of the badge to remove the metal ground plane, and was able to shine light through it, and then eventually Joe Grant actually was nice enough to send me some schematics that showed exactly where the reset lines were, just to confirm, but that helped me find the reset line, now I need to connect to it, so as you can see in the top, I had to scrape the paint off in the top layer of the board to get down to that middle layer of the board, kind of made like a little C of a flux on it based on a video I watched of repairing iPhones, so I made a little C of flux, and after a few tries, I was able to solder a wire onto this trace that was smaller than a human hair. I think this didn't actually work though, I think I had to go back and actually cut the trace, and then do it again, because the MCU was still connected to the reset, and was like changing the reset while I was trying to change it with the SWD commands, so I think, I don't know, I think that second uglier image onto the right of the soldering is the second time I did it, and so I was able to connect to it, but when I hooked the J-Link up to it, to the SWD, it could not communicate with it, because I didn't know what kind of chip it was, I was guessing different Cortex chips, and nothing worked, I thought well maybe I need pull ups, maybe I need pull downs, maybe there's noise, maybe I need to go slower, I tried everything, I tried going at like one kilohertz, and nothing was working, so finally, out of desperation, I just started randomly trying the default settings for a whole bunch of different chips that were related, or even kind of unrelated, and then one of them just worked, so I quickly downloaded the entire memory space I could, which was 0 to 18.000, and realized at that point, because I guess, I don't know, either screwing around earlier with the reset line being connected to two things, or maybe cutting it, or maybe just based on the way it boots up, but whatever little snippet that the MCU firmware sends over to the NFMI chip wasn't there, so the protocol was missing, but at least I got all of the other hidden stuff, because the protocol only makes up like a few hundred, maybe a thousand bytes, and I got a whole lot more than that, and all those hidden functions and stuff, so that was very helpful. So I pulled the NFMI protocol bit out of the MCU firmware, figured out the base address of the different pieces of it, and plopped that into the binary, just pulled out that 18,000 binary, and stuck that into IDA Pro, 
once again i couldn't find anything indicating like a packet length field or anything like that and i also confirmed there's code that actually checks to make sure you're not claiming to send more than eleven bytes and fast forward to the future i was able to remove that at one point but it doesn't do me any good because i can't send more than actually eleven bytes so if i fake it it'll try outputting it but it's outputting like zero that uninitialized garbage and it wasn't helpful but i had seen oversized packets happen before and i'd even log them as you can see in that log down there i'd hacked a badge firmware to spit out every byte it received and the length and after a bazillion length 22's i got a length 52 and then it crashed it said welcome to def con again so obviously it's happened spontaneously in the wild why how how why how do i make that happen well i was saved by some more bugs in the badge firmware so when the the nfmi chip sends that sends a packet over the uart and it's all padded out the badge receives it but instead of trying to copy the entire packet off of uart it just copies one at a time so that alone allows a partial packet to be copied if it runs out of space and then there was also this off by one error where it seemed to make sure there was always one more spot free so basically it's checking for two bytes free before copying one byte and that allowed it an odd number or odd sized packet which was nice because it would just chop off just the e at the end and leave my my b followed by however many bytes of data i had on there so then later on when the badge actually tries to use that packet data it starts with reading at the b and keeps on reading until it finds an e so with these errors i was able to send a b and then sixteen bytes of padded data and then no e i can completely fill up the ring buffer by just sending a whole bunch of these and then i tell the badge to read the moment it reads the first one now it's freed up eighteen more bytes so i if as long as i'm still blasting these packets it'll now write a second packet into that hole so and then the badge will keep on reading everything and when it gets to that last packet it sees a b and then sixteen bytes of these like or sixteen of these padded nibbles and then another b and then another sixteen and then an e so as far as it's concerned it just saw a thirty three byte packet but wait there's more so if you keep hammering that even more it's possible to send even like the max size eleven bytes which ends up being twenty two these padded nibbles so i can send like a b twenty two and then it hits that off by one error and chops off the e and then when a packet gets read it frees up enough space that if i'm still writing fast enough or transmitting fast enough it can stick another b twenty two in there with no room for the e and then since the badge is reading faster than i can actually transmit by the time i send a third one it'll um... be more than enough space for that e to fit in there too but basically i've now made a sixty eight byte packet and then i haven't actually played with this but i could probably even fill the buffer first with like super tiny packets like two byte packets to make reading take much longer and maybe you can stack even more than three of these twenty b twenty two's in a row b twenty two e's so now i can crash a badge at will a stock badge um... this takes a long while with a twenty forty eight byte buffer and it makes like a pretty boring demo so i cheated and i made a um, a badge that just has a seventy two byte buffer um, what i do is i basically fill up the buffer and then i drain the buffer so now that i'm like at a known state then i fill the buffer again and um, re read and keep on transmitting while that read happens and i'll should crash the badge so here the buffer is full i'm going to empty the buffer i switch over to new radio and start playing the packets as fast as i possibly can a little faster than display you can keep up with and completely fill the buffer and uh, the video glitches out for no apparent reason and then um, we go over here 
through the packets and it crashes. A crash is neat, but can we do something more interesting than that? Well, unfortunately that padding gets added to every single packet and it's going to ruin any sort of attack that we try to send to, to something more interesting than just crash. So we need to cheat. I have found the, or dug through the firmware for the uh, NFMI chip and found where it pads data and removed that and found that B and E stuff also and removed that. And we can still fake that if we want the badges to talk to each other like normal, but now it's optional. I just found all that code and replaced it with no ops. But to install that code into the chip, I had to figure out their crazy format first, which was just proprietary and weird and slowed me down for a while. But once I finally got that in there, I was able to do a lot more fun attacks. Here's a freshly reboot badge. I switch over to GNU Radio and I play my attack. It takes up four packets to fit the entire buffer overflow attack. Those get loaded into the buffer, switch back to the badge, I tell the badge to read the packets, and it executes my code. I'll end with a few oddities and mysteries that remain. Um, never quite understood what that initial packet that it sends out with that 0403E045. Um, at one point I convinced myself it was a buffer address, I don't quite remember why anymore. Um, sometimes when it's an error it sends a different code. I don't know what those mean. Um, there's also a rev string and another value next to it, and I was wondering, is that supposed to be a frequency or something else? I um, was never quite sure about if it was truly a differential signal or a double differential signal, because the preamble suggested it might be double. Um, never quite figured out what the rest of the preamble meant, not sure if the CRC protects it, um, tried poking at it a lot, didn't help. And where the heck does that mask come from? I spent a lot of while working on that, trying to figure out its source. Couldn't figure that out. Um, and there's got to be an easy way to stream or send longer packets. That would be fun to play with if I could figure that out or someone else could. And what is up with that convolution? Anyway, that's all. Thank you very much for watching my presentation.